As a result of talks between the UK and Manx politicians in September 1962, it was agreed that the island could set up its own commercial radio station, but only on 188 metres medium wave. By October, the Manx government had approached the leading radio and telecommunications firm Pi of Cambridge and invited them to act on behalf of Radio Manx. It was hoped that with their greater experience, influence and expertise, the directors of Pi, led by John Stanley, would be able to negotiate a better deal for Radio Manx. Pi, who were keen to establish commercial radio in Britain because they were well placed to provide all the necessary equipment, jumped at this opportunity and went even further by offering to take over all responsibility for Radio Manx, paying the Manx government a share of future profits. This seemed very attractive and the deal was signed in London in December 1963 by Sir Ronald Garvey, leading a Tinwall deputation that included Harold Colburn. Most of the directors of Radio Manx were shocked when they heard that they had been sidelined in this way and Howard Simcox resigned. Looking for an experienced programme contractor to work with them, Pye engaged the London-based Richard Mayer Associates. Mayer, a spare, energetic man, was a director of Associated TV and ITN. He had organised Rhodesia Television in 1959 and was head of Lorenzo Marx Radio, a profitable commercial station. In the early months of 1964, Pye and Mayer began to work on the practical details of setting up a transmitting station. First of all, they appointed a general manager for the new station. This was Mayer's stepson, John Grierson. Aged only 26, he had been born and raised in South Africa, where he took a law degree at Cape Town University and then moved to Cambridge, where he took a second one. Despite these notable qualifications, he decided to abandon the law in favour of working for ABC Television in London, and he then went out to Canada to work in TV and also become familiar with radio stations in Toronto. After this, he moved back to South Africa for a time, and then on to Mozambique to be assistant chief announcer for the Lorenzo Marx radio station. Pai decided that to start with, they would equip a 30-foot Sprite caravan as an experimental transmitting station and studio, and after being shipped across on the cargo vessel Peveril, it was towed by a tractor to a high point beside Hilbury Road in Onken, not far from the TT course. It had the words Manx Radio boldly written on the side. As no medium wave license had yet been granted, the VHF license already offered was accepted. The handful of staff included Jack Rutter, an engineer seconded from Pye, Jack Cretney, Norman Shaw and Stuart Lord, the first Manx presenter of music programmes. For his first broadcast, Grierson plugged into the round-the-circuit commentary of the TT race held on June the 7th and transmitted it on VHF, which only about 10% of the island's population could actually receive. Nevertheless, Manx Radio had at last found a voice. Of sorts. The commentary was transmitted on the 91.2 megacycle VHF waveband and according to one account the reception of the VHF signal was of high quality especially in the Douglas area. Listeners heard the voices of Peter Neal from the grandstand, Dolan Kelly and Jack Quayle from Sulby Bridge and Ian Cannell from Keppel Gate. History was made also with the broadcast of the first commercial when it was announced that the race broadcasts were, by kind permission, of T.H. Colburn Limited. Listeners were also informed that this commentary was only a test and that a regular service could not be provided until a medium wave licence was granted by the Postmaster General. After the TT races, the station closed down for a week while Mayer discussed what to do next with Grierson and members of Tinwall. Eventually, they decided to transmit on VHF for four hours a day in the hope that a medium-wave licence would soon be granted. All they could offer was non-copyright American records, general announcements and news items. A number of local enthusiasts offered their services to John Grierson, including the 29-year-old David Collister, who, after Douglas High School, had done national service in the Royal Engineers 
and gained radio experience with the Forces Network. Despite a real enthusiasm for radio and music, he worked in an administrative post for a firm in Braddon from 1960 onwards, but also developed a freelance career in broadcasting, which started when John Grierson offered him a job on a day-to-day -day basis in the caravan. Another local enthusiast who appeared in the caravan for one day to help Stuart Lord spin records was a youthful Roger Watterson. Playing records in the caravan was not a straightforward matter because the studio section of it was high in the air and subject to being shaken by the wind, which caused the needles to jump. The infant Manx radio was certainly struggling and the situation suddenly became potentially much worse when in July 1964 a powerful rival in the shape of the pirate radio ship Radio Caroline steamed into Manx waters and dropped anchor in Ramsey Bay. Yeah. 